In the final part of Unit 3, Section 3.5, we're going to look at chemical analysis. I'll start by looking at qualitative analysis. And what this means is, this is a test just to show if a substance is present in your sample. It doesn't tell us how much is present, it just says it is present. And there's two qualitative analysis techniques you should know about. First one is flame tests. And when you're trying to interpret the results of flame tests, you'll use the information in your data booklet. Okay. So on page six of your data booklet, you find this table with the uh, flame colors for various metal ions. And these are the only ones you're going to have to deal with. So I'll just show you a couple of flame tests to remind you. So according to the information in the data booklet, lithium should give a red colour. So I've got here a sample of lithium carbonate, lithium chloride. So when we put it into flame, you should see a nice red flame. And there we are. So a nice red flame confirming that lithium is present in this sample. The second quality of test you should know about is a precipitation reaction. And again, you're going to use data in your data booklet to interpret the results. On page A to your data booklet, you find this table of solubilities. Remember, precipitation reactions occur when you mix two solutions and a solid is produced. So the solid has got to be insoluble in water and you need to use this table to work out whether or not something is insoluble in water. So, for example, I suspect that this solution contains lead ions. I can test that by a precipitation reaction. So, I've got lead ions in solution, I think. So it's aqueous. And you look at lead, you see it forms quite a lot of insoluble compounds. So if I add a carbonate, I expect to see lead carbonate precipitating out. Or iodide ions, I'd see lead iodide and so on. So I'm going to add some iodide ions, okay. some I minus ions. And if there's lead ions in the sample, I'll form lead iodide, okay, which is solid, so it's insoluble. So the lead iodide is insoluble, so it'll form a solid. So let's try it. So here's my lead ions, and here's my iodide ions. Okay. So a solid has been produced. That yellow solid is lead iodide. So I know the sample did contain lead ions. It might not be obvious that this is a solid, but if you leave it long enough, it will start to precipitate out. Sorry, not precipitate out, but settle out. Here's one that I've left for a while. And you can see the solid is starting to settle at the bottom of the boiling tube. Now, if you ask to identify what this type of equation is, the clue is that all the reactants are soluble. They've all got the state symbol AQ, whereas one of the products is insoluble, and so it's got the symbol S. So a past paper and exam had been, they gave you this equation and said, what type of reaction is this? So it's a slightly more complicated than the one above, but it's the exact same. All the reactants are aqueous, so they're just solutions dissolved in water. Whereas one of the products is a solid, which means it's insoluble, barium sulfate. If we look at it up here, it's barium sulfate insoluble. 
So it's a precipitation reaction. Another type of question you're sometimes asked is, I'm only giving you two options here, but if it's a multiple choice question, there'd be four options. So identify in which case a precipitate will be produced. So we've got aluminium bromide and potassium nitrate. So aluminium bromide is soluble and potassium nitrate is soluble. So we've got aluminium ions, bromide ions, potassium ions, nitrate ions all floating around in solution. So the aluminium could also combine with the nitrate. So we'll look up aluminium nitrate, but we find that that's also soluble. The potassium could combine with the bromide, so potassium bromide, but that's also soluble. So none of these two things will get together. So this one's not going to produce a precipitate. What about calcium chloride and lithium carbonate? Well again, both those solutions are soluble. But the lithium could combine with the chloride. So uh, lithium chloride, that's very soluble. So that wouldn't precipitate. But the calcium could combine with the carbonate calcium carbonate that is insoluble so this one will produce a precipitate and the precipitate will be calcium carbonate so he here we've got some calcium chloride and here we've got some lithium carbonate if I add them together you see that it goes cloudy because a solid has been produced and the solid is calcium carbonate Okay, so there are the two qualitative tests we can use just to show whether or not something is present in the solution or not. More often than not, though, once we know that something's present in the solution, we want to know how much is there. And that involves doing a quantitative analysis. And we're going to look at two quant types of quantitative analysis. And the first one is going to be a precipitation reaction. So, having precipitated out my lead iodide, I could then go on and turn that into a quantitative analysis. And I'll show you how to do that. Right, so, in order to do a quantitative analysis of this precipitate, first thing we do is filter off the solid. Having filtered off the solid, we then put it into the oven in order to dry it. Leave it in there overnight. And then finally, we weigh the mass of the lead iodide produced. So let's look at a typical exam question based on quantitative analysis of a precipitation reaction. When excess iodide ions were added to a 50 cubic centimetre water sample, 4.61 grams of lead iodide were produced. What was the concentration of lead ions in the sample? And there's the balanced equation. So, it's a calculation based on the balanced equation. So, we use our, use our usual five step process. So, we're trying to find out the concentration of lead ions, and we're told the mass of lead iodide. So, that's us. Step one, identify the two things of interest. Step two, write down the mole ratio. So it's one mole to one mole. Step three, you can work out how many moles you've got of one of those things based on the information in the question. In the question, you're told you've got 4.61s of lead iodide. So we can work out how much number of moles of lead iodide we've got. We're given a mass, so it's going to be the number of moles is the mass of the GFM. We've got 4.61 grams. The gram formula mass of lead iodide is 461. So we've got 0 0.01 moles. Okay. So we've got 0 0.01 moles. 
So we know that the lead ions and lead iodide are in a one to one ratio, so we've got 0 0.01 moles of lead ions. And finally, step five, we have to work out the concentration of the lead ions. So the concentration, number of moles over the volume. Number of moles was 0 0.01. The volume of the sample was 50 cubic centimetres, divided by 1,000. 0 0.05. So the concentration is 0 0.2. Don't forget your units and your final answer, moles per litre. Right, the second sort of quantitative calculation you have to do is one based on volumetric titrations. We've carried out acid-based titrations in class. Can I just remind you briefly how we do them? Okay, so this is the setup for a titration. This is burette, which contains a known concentration of hydrochloric acid. And in here we've got the sodium hydroxide, a base. And we put an indicator which gives us this pink colour and then we find out how much of this we have the acid we have to add to get the colour to change. So I think we're quite near the end point so add it quite slowly and we stop when the solution goes colourless which is now. So we record the new volume and then work out the volume of acid required to neutralise the base. So when it comes to the exam, this is the sort of way you tend to get asked volumetric titration questions. They will give you a table with the results of your titrations. And the important part is the volume used. The volume used is just the difference between the final burette reading and the initial burette reading. So the important figure is the average of the volume used, but you only take the two results that are within 0.2 of each other, and you never use the rough value. So we've got two results, 15.9 cubic centimetres, 16.1 cubic centimetres. So the average volume is 16.0 cubic centimetres. And it's important to realise that volume refers to the amount of hydrochloric acid you added from the burette. So we know the volume and the concentration of the hydrochloric acid. At the moment we only know the volume of the sodium carbonate solution. But Basically, we're trying to work out the concentration of sodium carbonate solution, and we now have the information to allow us to do that. So, the second part of the question oops, is the equation for the reaction is this calculate the concentration of the sodium carbonate solution. So, the two things of interest are the HCl and the sodium carbonate. The mole ratio is 2 to 1. We can work out how much hydrochloric acid from the results. You know it was 16 cubic centimetres and the concentration of the hydrochloric acid is given here, 0.1 moles per litre. So the number of moles, C times V, 0.1 times 16 divided by 1000, so 0.0016 moles of hydrochloric acid. So 0 0.0016 moles. So the number of moles of sodium carbonate is half of that, so 0 0.0008. Don't be put off by getting these really small numbers, that's very common. So the concentration of sodium carbonate is the number of moles over the volume, so 0 0.0008 and volume of sodium carbonate, remember, not the volume of the sodium of the hydrochloric acid. And again, a lot of the information you get is from the pictures. So we're told there's 10 cubic centimetres of sodium carbonate. So that's 0 0.00, 0 
no, nope, nope, that's wrong, it's 5,000, 0 0.010, okay, so that equals 0 0.08 moles per litre. Okay, so to finish up, five things you must be able to do. Use flame test results to identify metals. Recognize a precipitation reaction from a chemical equation. Use the solubility table in the data booklet to identify the precipitate, given the name of the reactants. Carry out calculations based on precipitation reactions and carry out calculations based on titrations.